Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. I am thrilled to be a host of Framed in September, a readathon where we read a book about art, either fiction or nonfiction, experience art in some way, whether you do that by going to a museum or gallery, attending a dance performance, looking at the architecture of your local library or anything else, and perhaps making some art yourself. For today's video, I want to take you with me as I look at Impressionist and Post-Impressionist art at the amazing Barnes Foundation, a collection now on view at a beautiful building in the Museum District of Philadelphia. I first went to the Barnes back in 1991, I think. At the time, the collection was not in downtown Philadelphia, but in a small suburban town about 10 miles outside, located in a residential neighborhood. It was only open a couple of days a week, and you had to make reservations a few weeks in advance, as I remember it. I was grateful that they were open to the public at all, since the Barnes Foundation was established not as a museum, but as an educational institution. Let me tell you just a bit about its history before I show you some of what I saw on my recent visit. Alfred Barnes began collecting art in the early years of the 1900s. He was especially fascinated with the beginnings of modern art and the growth from Impressionism to Post-Impressionism. A great deal of the art he acquired was representative of those styles. He collected more than 180 paintings by Renoir, about 70 by Cezanne, 60 by Matisse, and even 45 or more by Picasso, for example, as well as classical Greek and Roman artwork, ancient Egyptian art, and newer African artwork and works by indigenous Americans. In other words, his was an astonishing collection. How could he acquire all these absolutely exceptional works? Well, he was interested in these early developments in modern art before other collectors, and especially before other museums valued this kind of art at all. Now the art is estimated to be valued at $30 billion or more. By the 1920s, Barnes turned his personal collection into a foundation dedicated to arts education. And he became close friends with John Dewey, an important thinker who sought to reform education in America. One of Dewey's beliefs was that education should be experiential, not rote memorization. Barnes, in concert with Dewey, believed that people, including not only young students, but working class people who had not received advanced education, should be encouraged to think analytically about art themselves and to know that it belonged to them, figuratively, just as much as it did to wealthy collectors. Most of the time, when we go to museums, art is displayed in a way that emphasizes art history. That is, who the artists were, what time period they worked in, which cultural or geographic area their art emerged from, and perhaps what particular artistic style they represented. And next to the artworks are all those little signs explaining some of that information to us and helping us piece the work into a basic outline of art history. But Barnes wanted to try something completely different. He and Dewey talked about how artists themselves think about the production of their art, how they use particular elements to produce the desired effects, whether it was a focus on shape, texture, contrast, movement, etc. And as they thought about how to use the art he'd collected to teach students to think for themselves, he decided to focus on four particular elements, line, color, light, and space, and think about how these elements could be seen in particular works of art. When he arranged the art in his home slash foundation, he stacked it all tightly, almost like it would have been in the salons of Europe. 
He arranged the paintings not by artist or by period, but by similar or contrasting elements in the work, arguing that that approach would make looking at art seriously a pursuit more accessible to people who didn't necessarily have much background in the subject. And as he hung the paintings on the walls, he added in metalwork and pottery and wooden objects as well. His intention was to invite comparison and contrast of what people were actually seeing right in front of them. That is, as one of the curators has said, the process was less about art history than it was about art appreciation. When Barnes died, he left detailed instructions for what should happen to his collection. He did not want the art to move, basically, not to be loaned for special exhibitions at other museums, not to disrupt the specific way he had laid out the art on the walls, etc. I won't go into all the reasoning, but in the early 2000s, the Foundations Board agreed to allow the work to move to downtown Philadelphia. There is a compelling documentary now available for free on YouTube explaining the conflicts and how the final decision was reached, a decision which not only violated Dr. Barnes' will, but also took advantage of Lincoln University, one of the nation's historically black universities and colleges, among several other issues. I will link to that video down in the show notes. Despite the very persuasive argument that it was wrong to remove the art from its home, I must say that now, 12 years after the move, I personally am very glad to be able to access the Barnes more easily. While many of Barnes' commitments were not honored, some were. The pieces were hung exactly as Barnes had requested. In fact, they were hung in these ensembles, as he called them, these collections of pieces that spoke to each other in some way, to quite literally duplicate exactly what had been on the walls in the original building since 1951, to within a sixteenth of an inch. And they were hung in galleries that were specifically built on the same coordinates, so the sunshine would even look the same on the paintings. So let's look at a few of the ensembles for a minute and think about how different this might be from the ways we're usually expected to think about art when we go to a museum. Let's look at this classic example first. Here's one of the ensembles that features two large Modiglianis and two similar Picassos in a very symmetrical organization. There's also a large display case filled with a variety of African masks, as well as metal door pulls hung between the art, a wooden panel of the crucifixion, etc. What do you make of this? Well, look at the elongated heads of the Modigliani. We see the same elongation in the Picasso paintings and in most of the African masks displayed here. So there's this profound sense of verticality on the ensemble, even in the metalwork. There are certainly a lot of other ways to look at this ensemble, but I think the larger point is that no matter what you see, Barnes asks us to consider echoes across not only artists, but across time periods and across cultures. The metalwork, often ornate hinges, sometimes serves to call our eyes to particular pieces of art, but often they reiterate some particular shape or line that recurs in the artwork that surrounds it. Here, for example, is an animal with curved horns. And here is a piece of metalwork replicating those horns. And here are instruments whose sound holes are mirrored by the metalwork hanging above. So here's another full ensemble.
Many of the paintings are of naked women, sometimes in pairs. Sometimes the nearby metalwork mirrors the verticality of the two women, but also points to rounded doubling at chest height. Here again, we see the vertical with the rounded attachments in that same basic position. As well as a piece of metalwork, we could argue might mirror the women's raised arms. The shape of the paintings themselves matters here, where the focus is on pointy frames. The echoes between paintings are not only in particular ensembles, but in whole rooms. This particular room has a large number of women who are bathing, often bathing together in a joyful way, and sometimes even dancing together. Dr. Barnes, fascinated by the way different artists portrayed the bathing women, commissioned Matisse to create these inserts of bathing, dancing women in these alcoves set high above the windows in the Philadelphia Museum. In this painting, we see a man in deep contemplation, and above him is a woman who also seems to have something on her mind. And above them is a lock and key, perhaps signifying their desire for privacy. And some of the connections are kind of funny. Here we have a picture of a swan biting the hand of a voluptuous woman, paired with a skeleton key with teeth. And in this painting, do you see it? She's smoking a cigarette. And immediately underneath the painting is a vase, something she can use as her ashtray. Well, it is lovely to talk about this incredible art collection. I'm really excited about the rest of this art readathon, and I'm hoping I'll be able to go to a couple of museums here in DC before the end of the month. I can't wait to see what all of you participating in Framed in September choose to read, make, or visit. Take care. See you soon here on Hannah's Books.